Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode and wherever you are in the world, I'm really excited about today's guest, Michael Mojo, and he is helping people raise their standards, gain momentum, and leverage the life they always wanted to live. Um, he comes to us from Australia, and I'm really happy to have his expertise and knowledge on the show for uh, the guests talking about mindset, um, disempowerment patterns, finding those and dissecting them and breaking through those uh, sales, psychology. I'm really happy. So, Michael, welcome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I really, like I said, I really love your energy and passion and you have a lot to give to the audience. So talk about how you started and your journey and we'll dive right into the story. Yeah, I, I won't take it too much time because uh, my, my story uh, can go for hours. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it quick. But look, I, I just, the usual adversity story, right? Like young kid, my parents were 17 and 19 when they had me. They didn't have any money. Dad worked two jobs. Um, mum stayed at home. She had me. And then, um, two years later, she had my sister and I started for, for my mum. education was really important because all of her siblings went to university and she didn't, she dropped out of school to have kids. Um, and so I think for her, it put a lot of pressure on her. So she put a lot of pressure on me to do well at school. Now I, I would say I've never been diagnosed with ADHD, but having understood and, and studied a lot of human behavior, um, I, I definitely would be in that category. And, uh, you know, I was told as a kid, I was dyslexic, put in special classes, all of those types of things. So, you know, I had those challenges and the adversities. Didn't really know what I want to do in life um, as a young kid, which most people don't. But at 15, I got expelled from school and I realized that I was a huge disappointment to my family. And I didn't really have a lot of friends because my parents were so young. We would go away every weekend. So we would go away to... Uh, a place in the Riverland. I would ride motorbikes and dirt bikes with, you know, 24, 25 year old adults, whereas all the other kids were playing sport. So I would go and have all this fun um, with my my parents because they would hang out with all their friends. They would party a lot, drink a lot, but we were riding dirt bikes, you know, racing cars, stuff like that, um, which most other kids, it was foreign. So I didn't really fit in at school. I got in trouble a lot at school. Then I got in trouble a lot at home because I was in trouble a lot at school. And at 15, when I was expelled, I just wanted to end everything. And that was sort of the start of my journey where I, I realized the night that I was going to end my life was the moment that I realized that I can't please other people. I'm not here to be everything to my parents. In fact, I realized that no matter what I did, I was getting in trouble anyway. So I might as well just do what I want to do. Now, that could have gone two ways, but luckily I decided to go back to school. I finished off my high school and then I became a diesel mechanic because I, I always loved learning, but I just didn't like learning in the uh, in the school system and reading books and things like that, although now I love it. I just was never taught the right way of doing it that matched my values and the things that I enjoy. So I loved cars, still do. Um, and so I just thought, you know what, I'm going to go into the mechanic. I, I'll, I'll become a mechanic. Te technology was moving in the mining industry. I'll get into that. Then about two years into it, I started realizing that that was not the career for me. I didn't like it. It was not the environment I wanted to be in. A lot of people were making a lot of money. And I guess this goes on to the topic of today. Um, there were a lot of people who were going into the mining industry in Australia because it's quite big here and there's a lot of money in it. So it was quite lucrative. Now, I thought, based on what my mum taught me when I was young, was that when you go to school, you, may, you, you do well at school, you go to university. When you go to university, you then can earn a well-paying job. You then make good money so that then you can buy a house, have a family, buy nice cars, buy an investment property, and then you set yourself up for life, right? It's, it's called the uh, Australian dream, but I'm sure it's the American dream as well in some way, shape, or form. So I had to self-reflect and go, well, all these people going to the mining industry, they're coming back and they're all miserable. They hate their life. The most common thing on Monday morning, you'd ask them, you know, how's your weekend? And they would say, do you mind if I swear on this podcast, by the way? Is that or yeah. not? Yeah, go ahead. You would ask them, you'd say, you know, how was the weekend? Oh, I was fucked. Why was the weekend fucked? Oh, well, the wife's fucked. Okay, how are the kids? Oh, they're fucked. And it, I mean, it's an Australian slang term that they use quite a lot, right? But it, it just was a common thing that you could tell that they weren't enjoying life. Everything seemed to be a problem in their life. Now, I thought the money solved that. So I had to sit back and self-reflect and go, well, hang on. Is there a link 
between money and the enjoyment of life? Or is there something missing there? Or am I mi- am I missing something? But the only place that ever made me feel good. Now, I, I, was, I had bright red hair as a kid, freckles, and I was chubby. So I used to get picked on a lot. I, the gym was the only place that ever made me feel good about myself. So at around that age, I started thinking, you know, maybe there's something that I want to do in the gym industry. Now, this was like 20 years ago. So the gym wasn't a cool place like it is now. People were like, they would read bodybuilding magazines and go in there and they were big steroid heads or they were in Lycra jumping up and down. That was about it. So that there wasn't, it wasn't a professional industry like it is now. So I decided that I was going to start to become a personal, become a personal trainer, which took 18 months back then. And I had to do night school. So I'd work 10 hours and then go to night school. I did that. And then halfway through that, my, I got a phone call, my best friend who was a friend and the reason why I didn't end up ending my life at 15. I got told to go to the hospital because he was in a car accident. And when I got there, his three-year-old niece was killed in that car accident. Mm. And I just remember this little white coffin going into the ground and thinking, how can life just be taken away so quick? Like we're here one day and we're gone the next. And, and you know, sometimes we don't decide when that is. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the time people don't. Um, and you probably see that in the medical industry and, and so on as well. Mm-hmm. So it made me really reflect on life. And I asked the questions or, or the question popped into my head. What's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? And then how do I want to be remembered when I'm not here? And that made me realize that the thing that I actually enjoyed in life was helping people. I love being in the gym because I love helping people. So anyway, to cut a long story short, the day I got signed off my apprenticeship or my traineeship as a mechanic, I quit. I put my toolbox in the car. I drove to mum and dad's house. I said, I've quit. My mum burst into tears and said, what are you going to do with your life? I said, I'm going to become a personal trainer. She said, there's no money in that. There's no career. No one does that because it wasn't back then. Now, fast forward, I was in that industry for about eight to 10 years, and there's a bit of a crossover um, time. But in that industry, the final year, I made uh, 265,000 the last year. I'd set up a franchise system. I was going out teaching other people. I worked for three years in a medical center doing physical rehabilitation. Um, I love studying, so I traveled all around the world to study. But then I realized, I was sitting in the medical center one day, And I realized that almost everyone knows what to do. They just don't do it. And it has to do with what sits in between here. (laughs) And so when I realized that, I started studying human behavior, started working with a psychologist and asking her a lot of questions. And then I started traveling the world, finding people smarter than me to (laughs) learn from. And I still do that to this day and age. I travel the world and find people smarter than me. And then since there, I've grown. uh, I I ended up leaving that industry, the personal training industry, started running events and seminars and and coaching people in, in mindset space. Um, and then since then, you know, I've built uh, a multi-million dollar company. Uh, I get to work with some of the the most amazing people from rich listers to professional athletes. We have a lot of people from the healthcare system and the medical system come through our events. Um, and yeah, that's uh, I guess that's where I am I am today. And then we run events and seminars for the public, and and you know, I have a podcast and stuff like that as well. But I just love helping people perform better. Mm. So that's that's my quick story. Yeah. You know, it's very inspiring because um, a lot of, uh, you know, I talked to, you're not the first to, and a lot of entrepreneurs encounter that same journey where it's like they have, they're not, they're neurodivergent and uh, the traditional system doesn't really work for them and they find their passion, uh, you know, because there's so many different skill sets, um, you know, there's athletic, there's uh, sales, there's so many marketing. Um, so, you know, kind of talking about this is... Um, so uh, a lot of uh, people struggle with this whole um, trying to fit in and conform and um, and just kind of they're like, yeah, this does, they know something's wrong. It doesn't work, but it's like, yeah, this is what's what we have. So, you know, either I go out and struggle and find myself or I uh, exist within this um, system. So talk about changing disempowering patterns. I think that a lot of the time, when people are disempowered, they're normally disempowered um, for a few different reasons. But I want to go back to one, I think, one of the greatest piece of psychological um, literature that I think is amazing. And it's Freud's original work called The Ego, The Id, and The Super Ego. And what Freud showed, well, what Freud spoke about was that in the mind, we it can be broken up in different components. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of summarize it. Um, in the most basic way. But essentially, our ego is the true self. So if you look up the etymology of the word ego, it means the true self. 
Now, mm. most people talk about uh, egoist, which is the inflated sense of self. So those terminologies get mixed. But really, the true definition of ego is the true self or the I, the individual. So mm. that's that's our true self. Now, even if you go back to the ancient Greeks, they said, be thyself, know thyself. So for thousands of years, we've been directed to know thyself, be thyself, and to discover who we are, which is the ego. Now, that is normally based on a set of values. So we have a values hierarchy, which is unique to us. It's not based on family structures. That research is out the window. Most people, when they talk about values, they're actually talking about morals, and morals are implanted values. And they come from parents, but our true values don't. They actually come genetic, epigenetic, and oh, there's a genetic influence and epigenetic influence, and then there is a environment influence on the values. And yeah. that's a field of study called axiology. So anyway, our, our values essentially dictate where we're going to be the most valuable in life. Then from there, that normally creates a mission in life, uh, our visions that we consistently have that pop up in our own mind, and it creates some form of meaning in our life. So we can create a purpose from that as well. So purpose, values, mission. Uh, I, call, I call that part of a success map. It's not the, the whole thing, but it's a success map. I actually, um, I, I created an event years ago and I still run it today, but essentially it's creating your success map in life. Because what I find is that most people think they know what they want, but they don't really know. And so they have all these hesitations, doubts, procrastinations, fears that keep popping up because they're actually not sure where they're driving. Right, I would have fear and doubt and concern if I hopped in the car and I said to my wife, where are we going? She said, I don't know, just drive. <laughs> now, you run out of fuel, hence why most people burn out. You get confused and stressed and frustrated because you have no idea the direction that you're going in. And so you're just hoping that you end up somewhere. That's like 99% of the world. Yeah. Probably even more than that, right? It's almost 100%. Some people figure it out, but most don't. That's your success map, but that that essentially helps us to establish the ego. Then you have implanted values, which come from parental figures or authority figures, and they happen from the day that we're born. So our parents, one of the first words that a kid learns or a child learns is no. No is a repulsion word or a push word to say, hey, no. Now the child's already starting to learn how to move things out of its space so it can figure out who it is. Mm -hmm. And then throughout our whole life, when you go through the teenage stage, teenagers just create arguments over anything because they've had their whole childhood being told, no, don't touch, don't do that because they're learning. They have to be told that, but they get to a point where they go, Hey, everyone else is dictating and governing my behavior in my life. I have to start pushing back and clearing space so I can figure out who I am. And that's, that's why they go through that stage. Now, some people develop their ego well through that stage, but most people don't. And so most people still have a very heavy influence most of their life on implanted values from others. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is when you work with a lot of people, like I've worked with tens of thousands of people now that I've, you know, privately coached or personally coached. So when that happens and you've got implanted values, every time you go to make a decision, it's never really your decision. It's a decision based on all the people who have influenced your value structure. So you go to make a decision. Like I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I was doing a sale to a business owner. He's the business owner. And at the end of the sale, he said, look, I need some help. I need to you know, structure my business more. I'm stressed out. I'm frustrated. I'm not getting to where I want to get to. So I put, to, I put the proposal together. And he said, oh, I need to go talk to my wife about this. And I said, why? Is she the business owner? And he said, well, no, not really. And I said, well, why is she going to make a better decision than you? And hmm. he said, yeah, I still have to talk it over. What he's saying is my wife's influence on my decision making is so heavy and so strong that I have to run it by her because if I do this, she might end up emotionally reactive because she's not getting what she wants in her value structure. And now we're going to have conflict. And so couples, because they don't understand value structures, they conflict with each other. Now, if you've got someone with a high value in business, they're probably going to make the right business decision way better than the person who doesn't. But the other person might have a high value on family. So they're going to make better family decisions. Now what happens is the person who's going to make family decisions around money is going to the person who's going to make business decisions around money and they're going to discuss it. Of course, if it's the wife, the wife's not going to make a good business decision. She's going to make a good decision around family. So she will know how to spend money effectively to make sure that the family's growing, not the business. So that creates conflict in relationships and so on. Mm -hmm. But this guy who's running a team 
and is supposed to be a leader can't actually lead because he's afraid of his wife's implanted values and that he's going to do the wrong thing, which is going to impact her emotionally and mentally. Mm. Now, what does he do? If he goes ahead because he wants to grow the business, then she might be frustrated. If he doesn't run it past her and, and let's say she, she says no, then he suppresses what he wants to do. So he starts to build resentment towards her because he goes, she doesn't understand what I want to do and he's going to blame her in the future. Mm. How is that going to work out? So we have implanted values, which then infiltrate our mind and that creates all the internal voices in our head which stops us having clarity on our decisions. And then we also have what he spoke about as the id. Now the id is where the word idiot comes from. Idiot means small mind, id iota, which means that we're driven by positives and negatives. And positives are, we have balance and equilibrium. And then when we go above equilibrium, we get excited. That makes poor decisions. Or we get depressed. That makes poor decisions. So anytime we go above equilibrium mentally and emotionally, we're probably less likely to make effective decisions. And when we are below the average line or the mean, we make ineffective decisions. And in fact, because I'm talking to uh, a more scientific community, I guess, if you look at the, the noble gases in chemistry, a noble gas has a stable outer shell. So it's stable. On, on column one, they are more, way more reactive. So people who are less mentally and emotionally balanced are more reactive. People who are more stable tend to be more balanced and are more noble or more wise. So they're more intelligent. They make better decisions. So Freud spoke about this in his work. The id is our mental and emotional impulses and our fears. And then we have our implanted values. If you can keep yourself mentally and emotionally balanced, you tend to live a pretty good life where you make good decisions. On the other side, if we live with implanted values, we're going we're gonna to suppress our value and our worth, and we're never going to live up to our own expectations. So um, coming back to the original question, because I just wanted to put together a framework for people, if we want to live a great life and we want to overcome a lot of things like procrastination, self-sabotage, um, self-depreciation, self-worth issues, a lot of mental and emotional volatilities, Freud essentially gave it to us in that work. Be thyself, know thyself, have your success map clear. Stay on top of your mental and emotional volatilities because anything that goes above equilibrium tends to make poor decisions and the, and the higher, the higher, the lower, the low. And if you're low, you will self-depreciate. You'll feel like you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. All of those things. And you won't have the energy to go for things. Mm -hmm. And if you're living with implanted values and trying to people please and impress other people, you're doing it for them, not for you. Then you're depreciating. Anything that self-depreciates, you lower your worth. When you lower your worth, you lower your ability to achieve and also to earn money. Mm. Mm. How's that for a summary? No, a very, very powerful. Um, which uh, one thing um, that I want to get to the heart of is, um, and I love this um, idea how you um, describe the various uh, influences that cause indecision, procrastination, that cause like you know conflicts, like um, internal conflicts you know, guilt and shame. Uh, one thing that I have a question about is like, let's say, you know, somebody's like, you can see it. I, I see it in kids all the time. They've got like so much potential, but then like they're being down, like they're being down by society or they're being down by their parents. And, you know, you got, you got, I see a lot of helicopter parents, like tiger mom and dads. And I'm like, I'm like, I see where this is heading, but I, I just keep my mouth shut. Cause it's, you know, but um, it's like, how do you begin to unravel all of that? Like you've got a kid with just so like he's got good worth, he or she's got good work ethic, so much potential, but then it got all this like negative baggage and conditioning. And at some point, like, you know, the shit's going to hit the fan. They got to either step out on their own or, you know, kind of displease the herd. So how do you, how do you do that? It's like, that's one of the hardest things I had to do. Um, I'm sure a lot of people listening as well. Yeah, I'll bet. I, look, I'm not a parent, so I can't I can't speak from a parent's perspective. But what I can is speak from a human behavior perspective and help people to understand that. So I'll give an example where I worked with a, a mother and a son who came uh, many, many years ago. And the mother came in and she said, um, my son's not doing well at school. All he wants to do is play computer games. And I said, okay. <laughs> now, this is more common than ever now, right? This was, this was back years ago, so you know, it's probably got, gotten worse. 
And I said, okay, what's the problem? She said, well, he can't sit still. He's been diagnosed with ADHD. And he, you know, he, he's, you know, she gives me all the list of things, the labels and yeah. stuff. I, I personally, even though I know that ADHD is a diagnosis, I, I don't like labels. I, I have a, a thing that I teach people in my events and, and even people who work in the healthcare industry and so on. Labels are there to understand. They are never there to define. In society, we're using labels to define people, not to understand people. And that's all they are. So, you know, I understand that having ADHD is a way of understanding how a person operates, but it is not there how to define how that person operates. So what I know about ADHD is that people who are normally diagnosed are hyper-focused in, in some areas, mm -hmm. which actually tells you they're easier to understand their value structure because that child has, he, he, it's very clear what his values are in life. The question then becomes, if his values are so clear, why isn't he able to live them at the level that he wants? Now, we also have to understand that in children, they are going to be more governed by their impulses, which is chasing pleasure and things that are easy, or they're going to be governed by fear, which is why Freud spoke about that implanted values from parental figures are there to stop kids reacting and it's a survival it's they need it for survival you can't just let kids do whatever they want because <laughs> they're always going to chase pleasure and avoid fear now as we all know i'm assuming to go to university and get a medical degree and things like that that's extremely hard to do mm -hmm. if you couldn't govern and regulate your own emotional states you would no one would ever do anything tough mm -hmm. so part of that is that parents who put pressure on their kids to do really well at school they tend to be the people who do really well at university as well and go through it because they have the parent when they're like, I just want to go out and drink beers all night. The voice pops in their head and they're like, oh, I'll disappoint my family. I don't want to. And so what it does is it governs your impulses, mm -hmm. right? And this is what Freud spoke about in that work. If you understand it and you, you really study it in depth. So anyway, I, I said to that parent, because I could see that the parent was projecting and implanting their values heavily on the child. Mm -hmm. Now that come from India. So they weren't, um, you know, that they'd, they'd come from India to Australia for a better life. So the mother wanted more than anything for that child to succeed. Now, what success looked like in her mind, she she didn't achieve the career that she wanted to please her parents. Mm -hmm. So now all she wants is she wants to get rid of that part of herself, which is I'm a disappointment to my family. I don't want my son to be a disappointment to his family. I want him to do the best. Mm -hmm. So the intention is good. But the problem is that her parents are doing exactly the same to her, which is implanting their values because they want the best for her, but it's based on their projection of what the best looks like, not allowing her to be herself and becoming her best. Mm -hmm. uh, so the intention's right, but the way it's done isn't the best. And I, I wish that society would go back to understanding intention over action or outcome. Because right? mm -hmm. I think right now, you know, I, I I know that you see it in in your industry and things like that, where intentions out the window. If you intend to do the right thing, but you do the wrong thing, no one cares about that anymore. It's just you did the wrong thing. Bad luck. It's you, you you're a bad person. There's a lot of that stuff at the moment. So anyway, she yeah. comes in, she sits down, and she said, Michael, look, he he plays computer games all day. He can't focus. He's distracted all the time. And she gives me this huge list of things that he does wrong. <laughs> and I said, okay, so he's distracted all the time. Can't concentrate. Can't sit still. She gives me all the usual list of ADHD symptoms. And so I thought, I'm going to set her up. I'm going to set her up and show her what she's doing. So I just asked her the question. I said, okay, actually, I asked him the question. I said, what do you love to do? And he said, I love playing computer games. And she went, oh, you can't play computer games all your life. You know, you, you can't do that. Yeah. Well, you can. Kids make millions of dollars playing computer games. In her generation, kids couldn't do that because if you played computer games, you were probably an outlier and you could never make a career in that. Now, people make millions. There are pe people who earn more money than professional athletes playing computer games and other kids watching. She just didn't understand that. I said, okay. Then um, she said, I, I said to her, what frustrates you the most? And she said, oh, he sits there and on a Saturday, he can literally play from like 6 a.m. until midnight. I have to turn it off. He like I can talk to him and he completely... And I said, oh, that sounds like someone that has difficulties paying attention. And she went, oh, 
Yeah, but but it's computer games. Tension problem. So he doesn't have an attention deficit. He actually has hyper focus on certain areas which relate to his values, but he has an attention deficit. And this is what happens. And unfortunately, I, I perceive that society treats a d- attention deficit disorder wrong. Not all the time, but just a lot of the time in general, it's not done well. His value system says, and, and part of it's genetic, part of it's epigenetic, and part of it's environmental. So he loves playing computer games. Some of that is genetic, some of it's epigenetic, and some of it is vi- environmental. It's not just an environmental factor that if we just turn off the computer game, there's something about that that he loves. Now, when I asked him, I said, why do you love playing computer games? He said, it's a challenge. Now, there's a dead giveaway for value systems. We tend to take on challenges that we perceive are fulfilling, which creates growth. Yeah. Right? I love going to the gym, but the gym sucks. It's hard. It hurts. All of that. But when I walk out of there, I'm proud because the effort that I put in, effort creates character. So I'm growing my character by doing challenging things. That's a dead giveaway to values. Mm-hmm. So he said, I love, I love playing computer games because it's challenging. It's tough. I get on there. I'm with my friends. So he's creating social networks. And then once again, she says, yeah, but they're not real friends <laughs> because in her generation, real friends don't talk online. Yeah. <laughs> right? I've, I've created friendships all around the world and I've never face to face met the people, but I talk like this all the time. Yeah. But if ever I go overseas, we catch up and we hang out. So she's behind the times. She's reflecting on her generation and projecting onto him. So he has challenge. He said uh, every quest or whatever that I go on, it's like I get to explore. I get to, you know, um, have these experiences. Um, it's tough. It's challenging. I'm with my friends. And so essentially his whole life is based around this game or, or gaming because it hits all of his values, all the things that are important. Mm. Then he goes to school and now he has to sit in mathematics <laughs> and he sits there and he goes, how does maths help me play the game better? And the truth is it doesn't. Listen. He goes, this is important to me. This is fulfilling to me. This is what I love to do in life. I don't understand how mathematics is going to help me. And so what he does is he shuts down. And our brain does this all day long. We go in and out of consciousness because we'll go back to our values. If you're having a conversation with someone, let's say you're a business owner and you have a low value on family. Someone starts talking about their family. That person starts to blank out and they start thinking about business (laughs) because our brain is wired to go back to our highest values. Mm -hmm. so this happens all day long you know i don't really get into sport i I love human behavior and i love the human behavior of sport but i don't i can't sit there and watch a game for four hours or three hours or whatever so when i'm sitting there watching sport with family i'm thinking about business i'm thinking about human behavior i'm thinking about my values so i switch off and i blank out and i go into my inner world not the outer world Mm -hmm. and our brain does this all day long inner world outer world so when our values aren't getting met we internalize all of a sudden, someone starts talking about our values, bang, we're on. And we become more focused on the external world. In my events, I can watch, if I've got 100 people there, I start talking about family. I watch people, they're like, oh, they grab their phone and they're checking stuff. And then all of a sudden, I start talking about wealth creation and you watch them, phone goes down and they start listening. Their brain is saying, ah, we're on team, let's listen. Yeah. So we move in and out of consciousness throughout the day to get our values met. When I showed her that he was hyper-focused on that, um, I, I then explained another story where I had a staff member that worked for me. And I, and I'll, I'll, I know I've gone off track, uh, not off track, but you know I've gone in depth into this. <laughs> I had a, a staff member of mine, Justin. Justin had a son, Xavier. Now, Xavier was, I think, seven or eight. And at school, he wasn't doing well in mathematics. And he, was, he would get in trouble in maths class. Anyway, Justin came to me and he said, how do I help Xavier? Because obviously, you know, he's going to probably do mathematics for the next couple of years before he can decide to do something different. How do I help him? And I said, well, there's a disconnect between what he loves to do and the maths class. So in his brain, his brain's going, I don't understand how this helps me to achieve what I love to do in life. So he switches off and disconnects. And then he goes back to doing things that he enjoys. So if he enjoys friendship, he's going to, he's going to distract people because he wants to create the relationship and the conversation in class versus listening to a teacher talk about algebra. So I said, what we need to do is we need to link his values so that his brain goes, ah, if I learn this, this is going to help me to achieve future outcomes. So what I said is, we've got to have some way of using his values and the things that he loves now and link it to to mathematics. So anyway, I forgot about the conversation. 
Three months later, Justin sends me a message and he goes, you'll never guess what Xavier asked for for Christmas. And I said, I got no idea. And he said he wants fucking textbooks on mathematics. And I said, you've got to be shitting me. What happened? He said, I think I overcooked him. <laughs> and I said, what happened? And he said, well, he loves playing Minecraft. Now, I've never played Minecraft, but supposedly they're blocks and stuff like that. And he said, I sat there while Xavier was playing and explained how it's mathematics. So he said, I would show him, show him multiplication in the blocks. I would show him addition in the blocks. I would show him subtraction in the blocks. And I started playing games while he was playing and explaining how mathematics was part of the game. And he said, I sat there with him for months doing it. Now Xavier is a straight A student in mathematics. He's mm. extremely good at it because in his head, he goes, if I want to play computer games and I want to build things, now he, he might go on and be an engineer or something like that. But he loves building things, and now he understands how mathematics helps him to be a better to to be better with building things. Does that yeah. make sense? It's wonderful, and yeah. I know we because we have uh, about three minutes left, and uh, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, sometimes I feel like the older generation just doesn't get in; they're behind the times, and you know you hit it in, and then um, you know that you hit you hit the nail on the head, especially with uh, Asian culture. You know, it's kind of they're trying to live through their kids. Um, so, but how can people contact you and follow you and reach out to you and, um, uh, just uh, check out your work. You seem very, uh, I love your work and how can people find out more about you? Yeah. So if you just go to, uh, Michael Mojo, so it's M I C H A E L Mojo, M O J O.com. Uh, you'll find, uh, all the resources there. Uh, you can check me out. Uh, it's Michael Mojo underscore success on Instagram. I do a lot of stuff on there. Um, or if you just type in uh, Michael Mojo, it normally comes up on most social media platforms. So yeah, you can find me there. If anyone's got any question, Instagram is normally the best place. You just shoot shoot it through. Uh, I have a podcast called The Underestimated Entrepreneur, where I normally drop a fresh episode every day. So I normally do Monday to Fridays, and I yeah. just talk about anything that I learn or talk about. I, I love learning, so yeah. I just learn something and then share it with the world. Nice. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's um, and. I really enjoyed this conversation and for all the audience, be sure to uh, give Michael's socials a like and follow. He's got 44,000 followers on Instagram. Amazing and amazing work. And, you know, check out his coaching if you need help with that. And with all, and thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me and uh, allowing me to go in depth into uh, those <laughs> questions. Thank you.